have genes on the front of the tree. So thank you all for our second attempt at live streaming our uh, service. Um, I want to thank you all for watching us. And as our pastor said, we do this for you, but what we really do is we're doing this for God and to show him how much we love him. Our first song we're going to do is Come, Now is the Time to Worship. And um, since uh, we're going to start singing, that sounds like a good song to start with. started this morning, we'd like to join, have you join with us in the responsive scripture reading. The words will be on the screen for you. I'll be reading the green, and you will follow in with the white scripture. Our responsive reading comes this morning from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come by wine and ye. Come. Buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear, that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure doubt for David. And I know our Lord has heard us reading these words to him this morning. 
You know, this time of the year is always such a blessed time because we're thinking about Easter. But this year, it's a little bit different because we have an unwanted member in our community. And because of that, we are doing something a little bit different. We hope that you enjoy this and, and, and participate with us uh, during this type of program. Now, although physically you're not here, I know you are spiritually and mentally. And I'd like to reach out to the community and have you reach out. We need each other now. We don't need to be isolated from each other. Get out those phone directories and start calling your friends and neighbors because they may be lonely and climbing the wall just like you are. We need to give our love to them and we need to share God's love with them. Now, as we go into our service, I'd like to have Doug come forward and he's going to give us some announcements. I want to welcome you all and thank you all for coming. Those of you who are here putting on the service and those of you who are watching either right now or will watch later. This is very strange. We have this unwelcome guest that Jean referred to, uh, the COVID virus. And it's, it's weird because every year we have people that don't show up because of flu. And it's our job as Christians to care for one another and care for people who might not even not be part of our church. But right now, because of how the COVID situation is being handled in our society, we're doing it very differently than we do for the flu season, that's for sure. But this morning, we want to honor God, and we want to remind you that even though the hub of our fellowship, our Sunday morning service, is dispersed this way, God still loves each and every one of us the way he would if we were here, and we are still his church while we're dispersed the way we are when we're together. We're still about God's business and God's life. So thank you for coming physically. Thank you for coming digitally. And now let's continue in worship after I pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the miracle of technology that allows your church dispersed to actually worship together. And I pray that you'd help us in this way that's kind of strange for some of us. Help us worship you. Help us figure out how to participate sitting on our couches in front of a TV set or looking on our phones and help us hear how to worship with just this core team of people and empty chairs. We're doing this because we love you, God, and we're doing this because we love each other and we want to pay attention together to what you have for us this morning. So help us, God. Help us worship you this morning in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song is Here I Am to Worship. And I look up uh, this particular song, uh, and I think uh, it's an appropriate uh, verse uh, for this song. And it says, in 2 Corinthians 8-9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. And it says, Jesus did for us that which we could never do, pay the penalty of our sin. He stepped out of heaven into our darkness. Truly, he is our worthy of praise. So let's worship Jesus. Here I am to worship you. Yeah. 
song is quite appropriate just as I am and those of you out there in the audience we appreciate your coming <laughs> those of us that are here are truly trying to reach out to you this morning just as I am right now we really have to think about that because we are being tossed about something is happening that we don't understand there is the, the fighting going on against an unknown source uh, the fears that we have for our friends, our neighbors, and ourselves. We really need our Lord right now. Amen. Lamb of God, we do come to you, and we ask for your blessings and care during this time, just as I am. Thank you, Jesus.
next time is turn your eyes upon Jesus. Most of all, you are weary and troubled. The light and the darkness that you see, and God can help us with that. Just turn yourself to Jesus and pray to him daily and help us sing this song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. 
Now it's time for us to break for communion, and we have Jessica coming up to lead the devotion. Thank you. first a little bit about communion and how God works through all things and share a bit of my personal testimony which I'm calling my Nineveh. First some info on communion, paraphrased from a blog found from New Springs Church. For thousands of years the church has continued a practice called communion. Traditionally communion uses bread as a symbol for Jesus's body and wine for the symbol of his blood. Jesus instructed his followers to use the bread and wine to remember his sacrifice he was going to make when he died for our sins on the cross. Every time we gather around the bread and the wine in church or in our homes, we remember Jesus is the one who provides all we need. But it's not about the bread and the wine. It's about the body and the blood of Jesus. It's not about the ritual or the method. It's about listening to Jesus and doing what he says. Communion is not an obligation, but a celebration. It's not about a ritual to revere, but a person to worship. Jesus is less concerned about the method of celebrating communion and more concerned that we're celebrating and giving thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 states, In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God, Jesus Christ, for you. And Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. In her blog, Heather Dixon writes, We know that all things, both good and bad, pleasant and unpleasant, everything, including every person, works together for the best for those who love God. Everything that we meet in life, everything, without exception, works together for our best. His plan is good because of the purpose it will serve. His plan is good because of the hope it will give. It is good because of the lives it will save. But really, it's good simply because of the God who calls it so. Creation can only be created for it to be called good. It couldn't be written more clearly, yet often, for many reasons, we can't see it. Amidst this global pandemic, it may be challenging for some of us to see God's glory presently. Yet, God knew the span of your life before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knows the hairs on your head, the thoughts in your mind, and the hours that you will live on this earth. He would not leave such attention to detail merely to chance. God has plans for you, and they are good. At many points in my life, God was working for the greater good, but I could not, or perhaps, refuse to see it. Yet other times, the pieces of the puzzle come together. A few weeks ago now, I heard a song by the Newsboys about Jonah, and thought this would be fun to incorporate into a Sunday school lesson. And no joke, and no coincidence, a few days later, Jenica gave me the Sunday school schedule, and guess what I was teaching? Jonah. I spent some time considering this and trying to figure out what message I should take from it. And I thought, where's my Nineveh? And I realized I'm here, and I'm loving it, actually. Right now, like Moses, I'm no fan of public speaking, but somehow I get called to participate in it. And it's even more interesting when you're not speaking to a live audience, I'm finding. <laughs> and additionally, it came to my mind a time when I was in school. And one of the things we're studying is called self as a therapist, was essentially understanding ourselves, our worldviews, our biases, etc. Uh, one of my professors asked me if there was any population that I wouldn't feel comfortable working with. And I blurted out something along the lines of 
anybody who's perpetrated crimes against women, children, sex offenders, that sort. Skip ahead to today, I absolutely love my job. Working with, guess who? I'm a psychologist working in a local community mental health agency located in the corrections office. Working with individuals on probation and parole. All types of offenses. Specializing in treating individuals who are accused of perpetrating domestic violence. I've been asked many times how I transition from working with preschoolers to parolees, and I joke, working with parolees is a lot safer. I haven't been bitten once. <laughs> But really, it's because God called me here. Through a path laden with toils and tears, he has strengthened me through my adversity. To spread the unconditional love that God has, he reminded me that all humans are created equally in his glorious image. And I approach my work humbly, knowing that I'm no better than they. Because Adam and Eve disobeyed God's instructions, introducing sin and death into creation, the image of God and humanity was not erased, but it was affected. Just as parents pass along characteristics to their children, so our first parents passed along damaged spiritual DNA to all of us. And we are now born with a bent towards sinful behavior. The Bible's assessment of humanity is sobering. We are all under sin, and there is no one righteous, not even one. Billy Graham defines sin as any thought or action that falls short of God's will. That's perfect. And anything that we do is going to fall short of that perfection. Romans 6.23 states that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16, Jackson's favorite verse, reassures us that God so loved the world that God gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The day will come for you and me when we stand before God's judgment and face, be faced with answering his call. And perhaps you, as I so often do, would rather try to run from God than answer his call. If you learn anything from Jonah, learn this, you can't run from God. So I ask you, where's your Nineveh? Many times we're just like Jonah, thinking about what it is that God's calling us to do right now that you don't want to do. Is it evangelism? Has God called? God has called each and every one of us to witness to Jesus. He expects us to tell others of his son and the salvation that can be found through a relationship with him. Are you answering God's call to evangelize? Or is this your Nineveh? Selfishness and generosity. God has called us to all be generous towards others and towards the Lord. Are you answering God's call to be selfless and generous, or is this your name of us? Action. God has called each of us to action. Unfortunately, many Christians make excuses instead of answering this call. Are you active in serving the Lord? Are you a person who has an excuse for your lack of service? Is action your name of us? Or is it forgiveness? God has called each of us to forgive those who sin against us. Have you, have you forgiven those who have wronged or hurt you? Or is forgiveness your Nineveh? Repentance. God has called you and me to repent of our wrongdoing. The Bible teaches that unless we repent, we will all perish. Have you answered God's call to repent from the things in your life that hinder your relationship with him? Or is repentance your Nineveh? Acts 16.31 states, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Yet to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is much more than an intellectual assent to the fact that he exists. Even Satan believes that. It means that you place your trust, your faith, your expectant hope for being saved in Jesus, who is the one who died for you. Communion is important because Jesus wants us to remember every time that we taste the bread and wine, or even when we sit in the tables in our own homes having bagels and coffee, that he has paid the price for our sin. Perhaps you're turning in for the first time and would like to learn more, please reach out to myself, one of the pastors. You can even just make a comment if you don't have our phone number, and we'd be glad to help you. Will you pray with me? I'm sorry, Lord, for all my sins, and I repent of all of them. 
I give you my life today, and I confess my faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, that he is Lord. I believe that Jesus died and resurrected to give me eternal life. And I confess my faith in him and accept him as my personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for our whole congregation, Lord, and for this world. May you be merciful. If you happen to have grape juice and oyster crackers at home, you may partake. If not, just please spend a moment of reflection in Jesus and what he's done for us. often speaks to me through song, and I wanted to share just a small section of a song that really stood out to me as I was considering what to share for the offering devotional, and it's a song by Matthew West called Do Something. He says, I woke up this morning and saw a world full of trouble now, and I thought, how do we ever get so far down, and how's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children being sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? And he said, I did. I created you. As far as I know, we don't have any electronic method for giving. So I kind of joked with Doug about how we could suggest the offering be sent in via mail, and I tease it, let's just not lick the stamps. Um, <laughs> but let's let this communion message and the song do something speak to us and however God would have it speak to you, whether that's reaching out to your neighbors or giving whichever means it's going to work for you. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for your steadfast love and mercy on us. Father, we believe that every word in the Bible is breathed by you. And we believe your promise that you will bless us when we are obedient to your word. And so without hesitation, we gladly give to you what is yours. Bless the tithings and offerings, be it financial or service, Lord. Father, we love you. Just kind of anybody.
somebody has an offering, just get it on the table here. I got one. With uh, all the stuff that's been going on, the COVID virus, our political war back and forth between right and left, conservative and liberal, with the ongoing church's marginalization in our culture, the ongoing struggle we have because of some of the very sins Jessica just talked about within our families, within our society, Life can be hard for everyone. We don't know what exactly each other specifically struggles with, but you can be certain that we all have our struggles. And at this time in these struggles, I would like to suggest something, and it's something I found in First Thessalonians, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter five. <clears throat> And Paul says this, chapter 3, verse 5, he says this, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And so if you can hear Paul thinking as he's writing this letter, he's writing to a church in Thessalonica, and this church is formed in an environment of persecution. The Jews don't like them, the pagans don't like them, the Romans don't like them, and they're showing it. Yet these Thessalonians received the gospel and began to grow as disciples and wanted to learn more and more from Paul and the other teachers. And so Paul's away from them now and he writes this letter. And he says, and I'll read it again. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ, oops, I'm sorry, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And obviously we all know Christ that God is love. And so he says, direct your hearts to that God whose arms are open wide, ready to love you. But this other phrase seems a little different. It's not one that's very common in scripture at all. It says, and to the steadfastness of Christ. And it pictures Christ as this person who steadfastly continues in the work God gave him to do. And he has done so for a lot longer than most of us realize. And so what we're beginning today is we're beginning a series that's going to take us through Easter. Maybe. PowerPoint needs to be in front. <laughs> Pardon me, we have technical issues. PowerPoint has to be in front. So close the, whoops. <laughs> oh, okay, well, if I don't have slides, I don't have slides. Perfect. <laughs> Our series is called The Arduous Journey to the Cross. Arduous, long, painful, difficult, trying, including all the temptations to quit. This is what we're thinking about, about Jesus' journey to the cross. And we all, when we think of Easter and when we think of his journey to the cross, we may think, well, when they beat him and, and they, they pulled out his beard and they spit on him and hit him with sticks and put a crown of thorns on him and they made him carry his cross, that was an arduous journey. But Christ's arduous journey began long before that. So we're going to look between now and Easter at these parts of his journey. Today we're going to look at before creation. I don't know if you realize it, but before the beginning of creation, God and Christ existed, and Christ began his journey then. And we'll see that in Scripture. Then we're going to, whoops, then we're going to talk about when he actually chose to come to earth to live among us and reveal God to us and then die for us. And then on Good Friday, 
we are going to have a Good Friday service in this kind of a way. We're going to do a webcast of a Good Friday service. And then finally, on Easter Sunday, we will celebrate the resurrection. But today, I want us to think together about Christ's arduous journey that began before creation. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we know that you have loved us and your Father has loved us from before the foundation of the world. But today, God, let us be amazed, truly amazed, when we realize that your decision and your death on the cross somehow actually happened before creation as well as in history. And so help us as we study the scriptures to figure out how this paradox works. But you began your journey before God said one thing about let there be light or let there be heavens and earth. Thank you, Jesus, for this steadfastness to stay the course from way back then until Jerusalem. So help us understand these scriptures as best we can. Most of all, help us realize just what kind of Christ we have who is not only our Savior, but our steadfast Savior. In his name, amen. Whoops. Okay. So, um, there are notes available, except for they're not online yet. I just um, posted them on the Facebook page. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things we're struggling with here is our internet seems to be fading in and out. <laughs> and so, we don't know how it's affecting you all who are watching or how it's affecting the recording of this. So thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. So if you're not looking at notes, but most of us know this verse, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so the Bible introduces human history, not only human history, but cosmic history, by taking us to that place where God suddenly acted and creation came to be. And people who think at a pay grade much higher than mine, philosophers and those kind of guys, they imagine not only did he create the, the physical properties of the world, but then the essence of the world, but he also had to create time and create space in which these things could happen. And so the beginning is the beginning of in the beginning, there's time, and then God created the heavens, and there's space, and then the earth, and placed the earth in it, and then later on, fills the heavens with things. And so God creates time, and space, and matter. But there's something that happens that exists before God did this. And John 1.1 1, 1, and many of you know that, gives us this. He also says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So he uses the same phrase, in the beginning, but he's given us a little backward push from what Genesis said. In the beginning, before God did this speaking of creation into existence, there was the Word, and there was God. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And we don't have time to get into that mystery, but that's part of the hint about this thing we call the Trinity in Christian theology. That God and Jesus Christ, the Word, are one and yet there are two. And then the Holy Spirit is the third member of that trinity. There's one God, and yet that God exists somehow in three persons that are distinct, each being God, but there's only one God. 
that's as best as I can explain it for you today. But how do we know that the word is Jesus in this verse? We don't. All it says is, in the beginning was this word, the word was God, and the word was with God. But if you scooch down in John, in verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 14, John writes, And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we understand that that word is John's description of the kind of messenger from God Jesus is. He's this word, but this word that comes in flesh to dwell among us. So remember, we've got these two things. There's the beginning of creation, and then there's the beginning before creation. And mostly we're talking about the beginning before creation from here on out. In John 17, verse 5, Jesus says this. He's in the middle of a prayer. And he prays, and now, Father, so remember, it's Jesus praying when he says, Father, he's talking to God, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So realize Jesus is praying, talking to God, saying, give me the presence now. Um, give me the glory now in your presence that I had with you when before the world existed. Um, and then let's also look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Here, Paul's in a rather long discourse, as Paul does, and he writes this. He, obviously, talking about Jesus, chose us, or he's talking about God and then Jesus. He, God, chose us in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world. Now think about that for a second. Creation didn't exist yet. Time, space, matter didn't exist yet. God is up in heaven looking at that non-existence, but because he's God, he sees that existence spreading before him that he is going to create. Because he's God, he can do that. And as he looks down the hallway of the future that doesn't even exist yet, but he sees it, he sees you and me. And he chooses. And what did he choose for? He says he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's what God chose you for as Christians. What he chose me for. To be holy, fully dedicated to him, and blameless. That is, when anybody watches me, they don't see me sin. And when I watch myself, I don't see myself sin. Okay, so how many of us are actually doing what we're chosen for? <laughs> As Jessica said, we have this problem, this issue that's bent in us towards sin. And so we're becoming holy and blameless. But then he goes on. He writes this. In love, he predestined us. And predestined is one of those theological words that we don't use in everyday language. Pre, before, destined. He chose our destiny before. And from the other verse, what did we get? When's before? Before the foundation of the world. God looked in that future and gave us a destiny. And here's the destiny. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. God predestined you to become his child, his son, his daughter, his child in his kingdom, in his family. And he chose us specifically to be adopted by him 
And then it says, through Jesus Christ. We don't get to be in the family of God because we're smart enough. Because, sorry, we're not. <laughs> we don't get to be in the family of God because we're good enough. Because, sorry, <laughs> we're not. We don't get to be in the family of God because much of anything that has to do with us. It has to do with God before the foundation of the world. Looking into that future, scoping it out when it doesn't even exist yet. And seeing you, seeing me, and choosing us and predestining us to become holy and blameless and to be adopted by him through not our own goodness and not our own smartness, but through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the means by whom God brings us into faith, into his family. And he's the means by which we become holy and blameless. And then we have one more verse to look at. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 through 8. When you get to look at the notes, you'll see the notes only contain the last verse of that. But I'm going to read it so we see it in its context. In chapter 13, John and the Holy Spirit through John reveals the beast. The beast is this antichrist creature, person, nation. We don't know exactly what the beast is, who the beast is. But he's rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. Okay? That's the context of what we're talking about here. But when we go down to verse 5, it says, And the beast, the one that came up out of the sea, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. For you math whizzes, how many years is that? Three and one half. This beast gets to do this, and he gets to do it for 42 months. And notice it says he was allowed to exercise authority. Who's boss of that beast so that it can allow or disallow anything? God is. This beast is not doing anything except without God's allowance, God's permission. So it goes on. <clears throat> Verse 6. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. So, what's the first thing this beast does? He begins spreading trash about God. Maligning God's reputation. Maligning God's character. Maligning God's existence. And in so doing... He's also maligning all those who claim to serve him, love him, and follow him. It goes on, verse 7. Also, he was allowed war, uh, to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Please note again the word allowed. God allows this beast to make war on his saints, the people who love God. The people who serve God. The people who proclaim God. Then it says this. It was, it was allowed to it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Think about that for a minute. God is allowing the beast to conquer the saints. God is allowing the saints to lose this huge spiritual battle that's going on on earth. And then it adds this. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Again, the word allowed. God allows this beast to commandeer, to take control of every nation on earth, every tribe on earth, 
every ethnic group on earth, every political organization on earth, the beast is now in charge. And this is allowed by God. And then it says this, verse 8, and that's the one in your notes. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Whoa. When it says conquer, it means conquer, doesn't it? But it doesn't stop there. Listen carefully to what it says next. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So this beast commandeers all the governments and all the tribes and all the nations and all the languages and he's in charge of all. And everybody bows down to him. But only everybody whose name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Please catch that. <laughs> before the foundation of the world, as God looked out into that future and saw that future and saw the church and the world and, and all the people and all the evil and all the stuff going on and he sees the church spreading the gospel throughout the world and as he brings this world to a close he raises up this beast and he gives this beast permission to reign over everything on earth and to make war on his people and when he's doing that he is allowed for all the people to begin to bow down and worship him instead of God but it's not everybody on earth because remember those are saints there are saints and their names are written in the Lamb's book of life they're not part of this worship <clears throat> and when when did Jesus have his book of life and when did he put people in it and all who dwell on earth will worship it. everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the Lamb's book of life. When we read about the book of life in Revelation, that book of life was opened before creation was even spoken into existence. Remember, God's back here choosing, and God's back here saving, <laughs> and predestining and they don't even exist yet guess what else he's doing Jesus is there with his book of life and God chooses and he writes down their names God chooses and he writes down their names God chooses and he writes down their names those names are written in the book of life before creation exists and God can do that because he already knows what Jesus is going to do because Jesus has already committed himself to do what needed to be done because none of us could be in that book of life if it weren't for the crucifixion of Jesus and so Jesus before the foundation of the world was already crucified allowing these names your names, my name to be written in the book of life and so when this beast is given all this freedom and authority and of this allowance to be this evil all over the world, everybody bows down except those whose names were written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. How long has Jesus been walking Toward that cross he started before God said I want a heaven and an earth <laughs> before that happened Jesus has already begun that journey to the cross with the commitment to make it all the way through 
I started this sermon with a verse from 2 Thessalonians, didn't I? May your hearts be drawn or taken or led to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. God loves you. He loves you with a love you cannot comprehend, I cannot comprehend. It's an amazing and astounding love. And Jesus maintains this steadfastness from before the foundation of the world all the way to Jerusalem and beyond to be what God needed him to be to allow your name and my name to be written in the book of life. Jesus is steadfast, isn't he? And Paul was praying the Thessalonians under persecution would be led to that steadfast Christ. So this morning I want to encourage you, whether it's coronavirus, or flu, or cancer, or an economy that's tanking, or some other trial you're facing, there's a steadfast Christ who's been steadfast longer than creation's been in existence. Go to him. Take your heart to him, your wounded, hurting, frustrated, confused heart. Take him your angry heart. Take him your bothered heart. Take him your whole heart. Because he is steadfast. And his steadfastness is why your name and my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for being the way you are. We thank you for being steadfast. We thank you for being someone who God chose us and you saved us. And you, get, you were what God needed and what we needed to accomplish the salvation. And I pray, Father, that you would help us see Jesus in this way. Help us see Jesus as someone who can and will continue to be what you, Father, need him to be and what we need him to be. And I thank you for that. Help us trust you, God. Help us trust you, Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our last song is Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Help us sing that.
Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now I'd recommend right now, don't worry about the Holy Kiss part. Mm -hmm. A, because you're not here physically, but B, we got to be careful with that stuff, right? Uh, the Living Bible, I think, says holy handshake. Mm -hmm. But even that's off, out, out of bounds now, isn't it? Six feet, wave, elbow bump, okay? Thank you for joining us this morning, and whenever you happen to watch this webcast, we appreciate you, we love you, and God loves you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>